Despite the satisfying way F9 continues the stories of Dom, Letty, and all the rest, there are a number of questions we've been left to ponder since the credits rolled. Here are some of the biggest. The newest and wildest adventure in the Fast and Furious saga is kicked off when Mr. Nobody sends an encrypted distress signal meant only for Vin Diesel's character Dom Toretto and his team. In his message, he says his plane is going down with dangerous cargo on board. Ramsey is the one who picks it up and wastes no time in getting most of the team back together. After some light persuasion, she and Dom, along with Letty, Roman, and Tej are on board. At the crash site, however, there is no trace of Mr. Nobody. After doing a cursory sweep for him and coming up empty, Dom's crew never seems to spend any more energy trying to figure out if he's still alive. Sure, it looked like a pretty devastating crash, but considering Mr. Nobody's apparent ability to arrange the impossible, it seems as though nothing is beyond his grasp. Speaking of Mr. Nobody and the impossible, Han is apparently alive in F9, despite the seemingly deadly crash and murder attempt in Tokyo Drift. The same scene which we saw revisited again in Fast and Furious 6 and Furious 7, except the explanation doesn't actually account for what happened. According to Han, he was recruited as an operative by Mr. Nobody. Apparently, this happened sometime between the end of Fast and Furious 6 and the beginning of Tokyo Drift, which chronologically takes place between the 6th and 7th films. Sometime before Sean Boswell showed up in Tokyo, Han did a job for Mr. Nobody that required him to stay hidden. Mr. Nobody then determined the best way to do this was to fake Han's death, as no one would be looking for him. It's a neat workaround for bringing back the character, except for one thing. The car chase Han was involved in when he died was completely impromptu. In Tokyo Drift, we see that Han is fleeing his former business partner after he got caught stealing. Previously, it seemed as though Deckard Shaw took advantage of that opportunity to take Han out by T-boning him with his own car. But now we are to understand that Mr. Nobody somehow staged the entire thing. Since we definitely saw that Han was physically present for the entire chase in Tokyo Drift, even seeing the crash from inside his car, there's no way he could have somehow escaped the car before Deckard crashed into him. Was Mr. Nobody lurking around ready to extract him the instant an opportunity presented itself? If so, how did he get Han out of the wrecked car without anyone noticing? F9 gives us some answers, but really only raises more questions. While Mr. Nobody's presence looms large over the plot of F9, even if he isn't physically around, his protege is nowhere to be found and isn't even mentioned. Introduced in Fate of the Furious, Little Nobody, who's played by Scott Eastwood, worked alongside the rest of the crew in thwarting their enemy, Cypher. Little Nobody was at the family barbecue at the end of the film, which is typically a pretty solid indicator that a character has ascended to the rank of family and will continue to pop up in future installments. Even still, he's completely absent in F9. Now, it's not a stretch to say that Little Nobody didn't make much of an impression in Fate of the Furious. Unlike most of the other recurring Fast and Furious characters who each have personality by the bucketful, he was by nature pretty bland and didn't add much to the crew. Granted, this was partially because he was a covert government agent who was supposed to be able to disappear. But even Mr. Nobody managed to live under the radar while still being an engaging character. So perhaps he was left out simply because he wouldn't be particularly missed. Still, it's a little odd that with a plot that so heavily ties into Mr. Nobody's plans, no one would even think to mention looking for his second in command. F9 actually does a good job of explaining why Dom and Mia have never mentioned that they had another brother before and have erased him from all their childhood stories. It turns out that in the race that killed Dom's father, which he told Brian about in the first movie, his car had been tampered with, causing it to respond poorly during the race. Teenage Dom realized it was his younger brother Jacob who had messed with the car and assumed he'd sabotaged their father on purpose. Dom banished Jacob from the family and never spoke of him again. However, it's later revealed that Jacob stayed with a friend of their dad's named Buddy nearby for about a year before moving on. This is a little odd, seeing that Dom or Mia would have possibly crossed paths with Jacob again after he left the Toretto home. After all, Buddy seemed pretty close to the Toretto family. Did Jacob have to leave the house and pretend that he wasn't living there if Dom or Mia passed by Buddy's house? That seems to be the only way they could have avoided running into one another and triggering an extremely awkward conversation. Dom says in the film that he knew Jacob was living with Buddy, so maybe the elder Toretto just avoided Buddy for a while. Dom soon realizes that the person responsible for stealing the device capable of hijacking every super weapon in the world is his estranged brother Jacob, played by John Cena. So Dom sets off to track down his long-lost sibling. First, he visits Buddy and learns Jacob has gone to London. Then he heads to London, where he asks Magdalene Shaw what she can find out through her underworld connections. Sure enough, she knows right where he can find Jacob and drives him right to his brother's doorstep. But while Dom's detective work is impressive, it also raises some questions. First of all, how did he even know where to find Magdalene Shaw? More importantly, why did he have to do all this tracking in the first place when he could have just used the God's Eye? First introduced in Furious 7, the God's Eye is a piece of tracking software that can be used to find anyone on the planet in seconds. The crew used it again in Fate of the Furious to track down Cypher. Plus, Dom has the inventor of the God's Eye, Ramsey, on his crew. 
So why the pond hopping when Dom could have cut straight to the chase? Did they simply forget they had the world's most advanced tracking technology at their disposal? So let's address the elephant in the room right away. There are a lot of issues with Roman and Tej's space plan. Please tell me that's not a Pontiac Fiero strapped to a rocket engine? Most of these issues we're willing to let slide because this is a Fast and Furious movie and realism has never been a major selling point for this franchise. However, it seems a little odd that after defying all odds and managing to destroy the satellite they were sent to disarm, they are then able to essentially hitchhike home with the astronauts aboard the International Space Station without any negative consequences. Granted, we don't actually have any clue what would happen if two men in scuba suits wound up floating by in a Pontiac Fiero outside the International Space Station. Hardly seems like the sort of thing anyone would plan for. But it does seem like it should be more severe than just eating Tootsie Rolls for a couple of weeks and then being allowed to tag along on their trip back to Earth. While it's possible Roman and Tej escaped on a technicality, considering the possibility that there aren't actually any laws governing what they did, the same can't be said for everyone else. Dom and his crew caused a massive destruction while working to stop Otto from gaining the power to destroy the world. This isn't the first time Dom's crew has leveled several city blocks or destroyed dozens of cars. However, in previous films, they either had to go on the run afterward or were working for the government, which presumably helped clean up the mess. This time, they're effectively on their own. This raises the question of why they're able to relax at a family barbecue at the end instead of being arrested for causing tens of millions of dollars worth of property damage. Not even including all the cars they destroy, they also take out multiple buildings with their magnetic shenanigans. It seems a little weird that no one needs to pay, literally, for all the destruction they caused, even if it happened in the name of saving the world. No one needs to know about this. Once again, just like at the end of Fate of the Furious, Cypher manages to evade capture at the end of F9, even though the rest of the team she's working with isn't nearly so lucky. Of course, sometime between the ending of Fate of the Furious and the beginning of F9, Mr. Nobody somehow managed to track her down and capture her, so we know that such a thing is possible. But at the same time, he didn't manage to hold on to her for long. Plus, we have no idea where Mr. Nobody even is anymore or how to get a hold of his covert organization, and we definitely expect Cypher to be even more careful this time about covering her tracks. So it seems like the odds of her being found before she wants to are low, and that whenever she does reappear, it will be in a fittingly dramatic and shocking fashion. F9 made an impressive effort to bring back all sorts of familiar faces from previous films. Even Brian was implied to be present at the final barbecue, although we only got to see his car. But one former member of the team was noticeably absent, Luke Hobbs, played by Dwayne Johnson, who's been an integral member of the crew since Fast Five. Behind the scenes, Johnson is busy with his own spin-off franchise, Hobbs and Shaw, as well as numerous other projects. But just because the actor wasn't available doesn't mean we aren't wondering where the character is. It seems that given the high stakes and difficult nature of their mission, it would have made sense to call in the big guns. But Hobbs isn't even mentioned in F9, making us wonder why the characters wouldn't have thought to call him. Perhaps they already knew he wouldn't be available. Maybe he's spending more time with his daughter or visiting his family in Samoa, whom he reconnected with in Hobbs and Shaw. Daddy's staying home. <laughs> there are any number of places he could have been, but it feels a little weird that the movie doesn't even hint at where he was. Early in F9, after surviving several situations that should have reasonably resulted in his death, Roman postulates that perhaps the reason he keeps defying death is because he and the rest of the crew are actually invincible. And while Tej and Ramsey laugh at Roman's outlandish theory, by the end of F9, we're kind of wondering if he might be onto something. After all, Letty and Han survived crashes that everyone assumed killed them. Roman and Tej managed to survive a trip to outer space in a car that exploded earlier in the movie, not to mention countless close calls for every member of the crew throughout the franchise. Of course, there is one person who throws a wrench in this theory, Giselle, who died at the end of Fast and Furious 6, saving Han. If one member of their crew died, it stands the reason that all of them could under the right circumstances. Unless, of course, Giselle is somehow still alive, too. While we're not holding our breath, after getting justice for Han, we won't rule anything out. And if Giselle ever does return to the family, there really may be something to Roman's bizarre theory after all. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.